Good morning and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation. Today's presentation is Dementia and Inappropriate Sexual Behavior by our dear Lucy. I want to tell you a little bit about her astonishing background. Lucy received her master's degree in social work from McGill University and has dedicated her entire career to supporting caregivers. Lucy was the founder and long-term manager of the Caregiver Support Center at a respite program for family caregivers. There she oversaw multidisciplinary training across caregiving, mental health, elder abuse, and palliative care. Whew. Big job. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2003 and 2012, she received the Queen's Jubilee Award presented by the Canadian Home Care Association, awarded for her dedication <clears throat> in developing a national coalition to support caregivers. Lucy also co-edited a book for healthcare professionals responding creatively to the needs of caregivers. She's been a key architect of screening and assessment tools of family caregivers for professionals across North America. She consults for private industry, including WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas. Additionally, if that's not enough, Lucy is a liaison supervisor at the School of Social Work at McGill University, where she currently supervises 20 interns. Lucy, we're so pleased to have you with us today and all your expertise and your background. So please go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you so much, everybody. So before we start, Happy New Year to all of you. And I wish you all the very best. Thanks, Evelyn. And Minerva is going to help me with my slides uh, today. As Evelyn said, I'm going to do the presentation first. And now I'll leave plenty of time for questions or suggestions or tips that you have. So, you know, our topic, for some people, our topic today is a very difficult one to discuss. You know, because it touches on our values, our culture, our religion, and how we ourselves feel about sex, especially as we age, and especially when the person we are caring for with dementia exhibits inappropriate sexual behavior. So how does one deal with this situation? It's a very difficult one for sure. So if we go to the next slide, so let's take a look at what I'm going to be discussing today. So basically what I'm gonna talk about is what is an appropriate sexual behavior in dementia and what it looks like, what, what is it? The other thing that's really important is why does this behavior happen to some people that have dementia? What could trigger this behavior? So is it just sexual or are there other reasons behind it? And how to handle inappropriate sexual behaviors when it actually does occur? And I will give you tips on how to deal with these difficult sexual behaviors. So we're going to go through all that. Now, I do want to go in a little bit further and tell you that in my practice, many caregivers feel embarrassed to discuss this matter and feeling very much alone. So I'd like to share some questions that I received from caregivers by email, and maybe you can relate to them as well. So let's start. Dear Lucy, it is so embarrassing to be asking this question. My husband and I have been married for over 50 years. We had a very close relationship. My husband was the pastor at our church until his retirement. He has been diagnosed with dementia for the past five years, and I'm his caregiver. He manages fairly well with most of his daily activities. However, lately, he has been behaving very differently. My husband never said a bad word in his life, but lately he has started to swear and swear a lot and accuses me of having extramarital affairs. I'm beside myself. I don't know what to say. This is becoming very stressful and I'm too embarrassed to speak with my children or anyone else about what is going on. And she signed it, help, Helen. Let me share another one with you. Dear Lucy, my parents are both in their 80s and on and live on their own. My father has dementia and my mother is his full-time caregiver. Two of my siblings live out of town. I visit my parents a few times a week, shop and do the laundry for them. My father and I have always had a very close relationship and he used to call me his princess. Lately, I feel him to be more forgetful uh, and not himself. 
my last visit was very traumatic for me. I was helping dad out of his chair when he stood up, grabbed me and started to kiss me, but not like a father kisses his daughter. I was so taken aback that I left as soon as possible and never told my mother um, what took place. What should I do? Did I do something wrong? Thank you for listening. I hope to hear from you. And she signed it, Carolina. And the last one says, hello, I'm not sure how to start. My wife and I decided to, uh, to have my mother uh, live with us after she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She's been living with us for the past uh, two years, and my children really enjoy having her here. The problem is that a few months ago, she started taking off her clothes at different times of the day and became very agitated when she told not to do it. This is so embarrassing to me, especially when the kids start laughing. What's going on? I have no one to talk to. And he signed it, Carlos. You know, these are just three examples of the kind of situations that a lot of caregivers find themselves in when we talk about sort of different sexual um, behaviors that seem to be inappropriate and that these people never displayed it before. But I do want to say that the need for close human contact does not decline with age or dementia. Those with dementia, and this is something to really keep in mind, communicate with behavior rather than speech, meaning that they're at the point where they can't express themselves. So obviously it comes out in different forms, not necessarily always in a sexual form. It could be very, it could be in different forms of being angry or aggressive. You know, the basic need to belong, to be desired, to share does not end with dementia. Sexuality and intimacy are a fundamental part of human existence. Even though in our society, and it's kind of changing a little bit, a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about sex or intimacy, especially in regards to seniors. So there's kind of an ageist thing going on as well. But keep in mind that many seniors continue to have very meaningful sexual relationships throughout their lives, and that is extremely healthy. So if our some professionals are with us today, you know, we have to think about ourselves. How do we feel? Are we comfortable enough to open up a discussion with our clients when these things arise? So going back to what I said originally, you have to kind of see where, where are you at? How do you feel about that? <clears throat> Excuse me. But today I will only address the inappropriate sexual behaviors that some people with dementia display. Now, I don't want you to think that all people with dementia uh, behave this way, but there is a, a percentage that do. Inappropriate sexual behavior is disturbing and, I, and it can happen when someone has Alzheimer or any other dementia. It could be one of the most challenging behaviors to handle for caregivers because it often makes caregivers, family members, friends, and even strangers feel uncomfortable, embarrassed, frightened, and I can certainly understand why. You know, I sympathize with what uh, many of caregivers go through, but for people who are not comfortable about sexuality in general, this whole issue is extremely overwhelming. So if you are a professional and you are dealing with family caregivers or your clients in particular, and these issues arise, it's important to kind of reassure them that it's normal, that it's something that they have an opportunity to talk about. Now, for couples who have had good sexual relationships, the fact that your spouse or partner becomes aggressive or insists on more physical contact can be disturbing, difficult to manage, and it can be absolutely exhausting. And uh, caregivers need to have an opportunity to talk about things like that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, where some of this uh, resources and help, but if you are a professional um, in the healthcare system, this is something that you should be aware of as well. You know, people with dementia, are, as I said before, often communicate with behavior rather than with speech. Their behavior may appear to be sexual in nature, but in fact, it may be an unmet need that they cannot express. That is, you know, this is why it is very important 
to assess what is actually going on. And so what I really want to focus on today is the whole idea is just don't take it at face value that that's it. We have to really understand it. We have to know where it's coming. Now, <clears throat> the same uh, goes for adult children who are caring for parents, maybe a sister, brother, a niece, a nephew, or any other family um, or friend. So let's go, let's go down to what do I mean by inappropriate sexual behavior? If we can change the slide, please. Now, just to review it very quickly, as I said before, inappropriate sexual behavior can be disturbing, frightening, and embarrassing. Sexuality, as I said, touches on our value system, our culture, beliefs, and religion. How we feel about sex, especially as we age, will dictate our response. Okay, the need for hu close human contact does not decline with age or dementia. Sexuality and intimacy are a fundamental part of human existence. Discomfort talking about sex or intimacy. Those with dementia often communicate with behavior rather than with speech. So I'm a kind of a little um, repeating myself, but it's important. Now, all these slides will be available to you so you don't have to write it all down. Um, and then Evelyn will tell you how to be able to access that. So can we go to the next slide, please? So let's look at what is inappropriate sexual behavior. Now, what it is, is sexual advantage towards others, okay? That, you know, they're just doing it. They, they want to grab you. They want to touch you. They want to kiss you. Masturbating or fondling genitals. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about this. This is in front of other people, all right? But please keep this in mind, that if somebody is masturbating or touching themselves and it's not causing them any harm and they're, they seem to be perfectly okay, why don't we just leave them alone? It's maybe your uncomfort level that's kind of making it an issue um, because masturbating and touching is a normal part of human beings. Now, the other part of inappropriate sexual behavior could be sexual language, meaning swearing, and being explicit about commands. I want you to do this to me. I want to do this to you. Now, even, I know it sounds kind of strange, but removing one's clothes and getting undressed can be seen as a sexually inappropriate uh, way of uh, handling it. But I remember one client in particular that I went to that would take off her clothes and the family couldn't understand it. But once I explored it a little bit more, this person used to walk around naked when they didn't have dementia. They felt very comfortable about that in their own home. There's nothing wrong with that. So once the family kind of understood it, oh my gosh, yes, mom never did cover herself very much. So it sort of became normal and they kind of allowed her to do that um, if nobody was around, obviously. Exposing self in public or at home when others are present. So these are all really difficult things for caregivers to kind of, how do I deal with all this? But it's so important to understand what causes sexual inappropriate behavior for some people with dementia. So, you know, it might seem strange as someone you once knew was proper and respectful. I mean, listen, some just because somebody is old doesn't mean they haven't told dirty jokes or, you know, they haven't said certain things. It's only normal. But what I'm talking about is really all these four, uh, two, four, five different uh, to uh, topics that I was talking about that all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes unmanageable. So the other thing that I do want to also say um, is that, uh, no, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Next slide, please. So what causes inappropriate sexual behavior? Now, I left you a whole bunch of resources with articles to read. So I'm kind of focusing in the very simple words, but there's many reasons. It's caused by damage to their brain, okay? And when you have dementia, there is damage in your brain. Dementia affects parts of the brain that controls a person's ability to control their own responses, meaning that they're not, they, they really at that point 
have no clue about exactly what they're doing or saying. Inappropriate sexual behaviors could reflect, as I said, an unmet need. And I'm gonna talk about what I mean by that. Now, their sensory perception may have been affected eyesight, hearing, smell, and touch, okay, as we age as well, normally, whether you have uh, dementia or not. For example, it's common for people with dementia to not recognize their caregiver, their spouse, their partner, their lover. They may mistake their daughter for their wife. But if this happens, try not to scold them or embarrass them. Remind them who you are. It is very difficult. Now, when I talk about sensory perception, sometimes when someone's eyesight is poor, and let's say you're in a room that's a little bit dark, they might, you know, they might approach someone um, not knowing who they are and not seeing, hearing. So it's really important that people with dementia really wear their eyeglasses and hearing aids are up to shape and they go to the, uh, to the doctor to check all these things out that the eyeglasses are clean and that their hearing aids are working. The other thing I wanna also talk about is that certain medications can boost someone's sex drive or cause aggressive uh, behaviors. It's very important to keep that in mind. Now, now, I'm not only talking about prescription medication, I'm talking about over-the-counter medication. You know, the person may have had a cold, you went and got some cold medication, uh, they're not sleeping, so you got some uh, sleeping pills, vitamins, herbal, anything like that. Please do not buy anything over the counter without speaking to the pharmacist first. I do a whole session on medication. It's so important to have one pharmacist that knows all the medication that the person that you're caring for is taking as well as for yourself. So um, that's something that should be never taken for granted about over-the-counter medications. So what I do want to tell you that if a loved one or the person you're taking care of all of a sudden starts behaving inappropriately, sexually, or any other way, so it has, doesn't have to be only sexual, they're more aggressive, they're restless, they're just not themselves, it's time to call the doctor, okay? Explain to the doctor what is happening. Keep in mind that the behavior may be caused by certain medications and other physical problems that you're not even aware of. They could have a urinary tract infection. If they are, if they are diabetic, maybe things are going, um, it, it's, not, it, it's not stabilized. Or any other medical problem that you're not aware of. And the doctor needs to know that. So observe, observe what their behavior is and even write it down so that when you go to the doctor, it's very, very clear of what is happening. Now, the doctor may want to prescribe some new medication. So ask, are there, what are the side effects? Or, you know, you know, to calm the person down, there are medications to just take the little edge off, but you have to know what are the side effects or they may reduce the medication that the person is already taking. And obviously bring all the medications that the person is on to the doctor's office, as well as all over the counter medications as well. Now, if you have a nice relationship with this doctor, you can always tell them the difficulties that you're going through, and maybe they can make a referral for you to get some help. And I'll talk a little bit more about where help is available. Uh, for you as well. So just looking at the time, let's look at the slide again, the next slide, please. So you're wondering, why is it important to share? What do I mean by that? But I think that it's really important to explain inappropriate sexual behaviors to family member, friends, and people that you trust, obviously not to anyone, because the need to, uh, to know that the behavior is ca uh, caused because of the dementia in their brain due to Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia. They have to understand that this person's behavior is not, they're not doing it because they want to be sexual in any way, but it's because there's damage in their brain. If they don't understand, they may not want to visit or be angry with the person or even embarrassed for you. So you, you know, that's more 
they, you might be more isolated if you don't explain it to the people that you trust. Now, I do believe, and from my own uh, experience with caregivers, people who care about both of you will stand by you and they could be a great support to you and the person with dementia. So this is something to really, really think about. You know, before we, before we move into how to handle the difficult behavior, we need to recognize the triggers. So let's go to the next slide and take a look at what do I mean by triggers? So as I said before, their behavior appears to be sexual, especially if they're really doing something very obvious, but it could be for totally different reasons. And what I'm telling you has to do with research, not just my own experience. Research, there's lots of research on this topic. And when you look at the references, you'll see that and you can look it up for yourself. Many times they're just bored. And remember what I said, that people with dementia don't have the voice exactly to tell you what's going on. They can't say I'm bored. So they act in different ways. They could be cold or they could be hot and they can't tell you. They have pain that they're not able to express and you're not even aware that something is going on. They may need to go to the bathroom and they can say, take me to the bathroom. So they're agitated, they're pulling at their zipper, they're trying to get undressed and you're saying, what the heck is going on here? They could be just plain tired. They could be hungry. They could be more confused that day because you know with dementia, there's good days and there's bad days. And again, obviously when you see what's going on, as I said before, make an appointment with the doctor as soon as possible. But it's also, and this is also through research as well as my own uh, experience, use a journal to keep track of what's going on. So what I mean is track their behavior when it happens. It will help you to have some control over it if uh, the same behavior happens at the same time. So sometimes caregivers will say to me, you know what, they're fine, but I don't know why, but it's three o'clock in the afternoon, all of a sudden, they're changing their ways, they're agitated, they're this, they're that. So if you kind of keep a journal and you realize that at certain times of the day, there's a possibility that they may behave differently, you'll be prepared. What do I mean by be prepared? You might be able to say, well, let's go to the bathroom, you know, and maybe that will be what he, that person really needs. Or would you like some water or Bring a, if, if they can't answer you and you think maybe it's cold because the room is a little cold, bring a sweater. So this is what I'm saying about being prepared and looking at the triggers. Now, so how does a caregiver deal with this behavior? So I've been telling you all these things and bringing you to a point where you can kind of understand every person Remember this, every person responds differently to an intervention. What I mean by an intervention is that you're trying to sort of stop this behavior. So here are a few tips you can experiment to see which uh, ones work for you and your loved one. And I'll give you different ones. I want you to remember these three words. It's deflect, distract, and redirect. So what, am I, what do I mean by deflect? Now, what you're trying to do when someone is agitated, let's I'll take that example, or trying to take their clothes off, what you want to do is you want to get their attention. That's what you want to do. You want them to get their attention. How do you get a person's attention? You can change the subject and say, oh, come, let's go over to the window, take a look at what's going on. You can get their attention by looking at them in the face, you know, calling out their name, doing eye contact. As I said, ask a question if they can answer. You can do something, a turn on the TV or whatever. So that's your first thing. You really want their attention. Once you got their attention, you want to distract them from that behavior. So many times what really is helpful from caregivers themselves is just take them to another room. If they're in the living room, at the kitchen, the bedroom, Offer them a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, whatever it is to distract them. So you've kind of distracted them. They've got, you've got their attention. Now you want to redirect 
What do I mean by that? You want to redirect them to do an activity with them so that they kind of, kind of not necessarily forget, but are in the moment. So some of activities are extremely good, and I can go over many, but there are. Reminiscing is great. Have these things handy. Um, pictures, album, watching TV, listen to music. Music is amazing. Sing along, go for a walk, use laughter as a means of redirecting. But what caregivers told me, and that was their tip to me, is have these things handy so you don't have to go looking for your album, your picture book. Okay, so maybe put things away like crayons and paper, uh, music that would be readily available for you to click on and put on. Um, and if, if whatever it is, when I say sing along, you could have a sheet of songs so that it's there. So this is this actually really works many, many times. It takes a little bit of practice. So remember, deflect, you want to get their attention, distract them at that point, and redirect them to an activity that is really easy for you to get a hold of. Keep all these in mind because I'm going to give us an opportunity to talk about uh, any other suggestions that you may have. Now, if deflecting or distracting or uh, redirecting does not always work, let's look at other uh, kind of tips that um, would be handy for you. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, but before we do that, I do want to say that in all situations, no matter what, you got to stay calm and be patient. Easier said than done. But gently but firmly tell the person the behavior is inappropriate. That's if that deflecting and redirecting is not working. Now, it's so important to match your body language to your words. Think of your tone, your voice, and facial expression. You know, if you want to say something to someone, uh, it depends how you say it. It depends whether you raise your voice. It depends whether you're smiling because they might not understand your words, but they will understand your, your body language, hopefully. But it's also very important to maintain consistent firm boundaries. Don't accidentally encourage inappropriate behavior by sending mixed uh, signals. You can always say, now again, my tone will be like this. No, stop, I don't like that. Or no, stop, don't like that at all, or don't do that, or stop, that's not right. Okay, so my body language is there. I'm being firm, but I'm still being, I'm not raising my voice. Now, the other thing, unfortunately, sometimes people shame that person by trying to make sure that they don't uh, behave that way. So please don't shame them at all. And please, please don't argue with them. Arguing with someone with dementia that is exhibiting any form of difficult behavior, regardless of what it is, will only escalate the situation. So as healthcare workers try, this is huge for you to try and talk to your caregivers or your clients that arguing is not a way to handle this. Now, watch for nonverbal cues. Remember, I told you about those. See, maybe there is something going on. Of course, show empathy, you know? Remember, it's the disease that is affecting their behavior. They're not doing this on purpose. All right, so let's move on. Here are a few other suggestions that all these suggestions did not come from me. They came from caregivers, all right? I did a survey. This is what came out and it's interesting. So some of them said that suspenders and overalls may be a better choice when someone is trying to take off their clothes. Obviously, they're a little uh, more restrained, but you have to be careful with that. Also, you have to be make sure to say, "Would you? do you need to go to the bathroom at that point? Because you don't want people to have accidents just because they've got suspenders and overalls on, okay? Now, this one is interesting, wearing an apron with pockets filled with interesting objects to keep their hands occupied. Now, this could be for men and women, 
And it actually really worked for some people because when you put things in the pocket, it could be all kinds of objects. One caregiver put a lot of pictures of family. So when the person picked it up, they would look at it and then they would talk about it or, you know, engage. Balls are good. Um, one gentleman left to, to, um, to uh, count coins. So his wife put a lot of coins in it and he would look at the coins and he would sort of talk about it. So anything, a cuddly little toy is also some fabrics really that are soft. You know, we like to touch these lovely soft fabrics. It calms them down. If they become restless, try to put a pillow on their lap. That works a lot too, because there's something there. They can also touch it and, and feel it and feel a little bit more warmth. If they're restless in bed, now a big body pillow could be helpful. Now that's what caregivers also said that many times at night, you know, you can buy them. They're these big pillows that they can hug and they feel that somebody is close to them and it's very reassuring. Um, and I think this in general is a good, a very good tip that caregivers told me. When you're in public, always carry uh, a shawl um, if they start removing their clothes, you know, to, to sort of protect them. But it's also good to have around in case it gets cold. So I'm going to ask you if you have any suggestions as well. <laughs> All right. So um, let's go to the next one. Now, if your loved ones becomes, and so I'll go through this, okay? So just keep this in mind. It doesn't have to be about them being sexually inappropriate. It's about any difficult, dangerous behavior. They may get angry. So remember, the worst thing that you could do is argue with them. Just let them be. They may hit, punch, curse, or scream. Again, don't argue with them. Move away from them. And I'll talk about what I mean, put a plan in place, call a family member or friend to come over as soon as possible. If the behavior escalates, you can't and you can't control it, you may need to call 911. What I want to tell you that if your loved one or the person you're caring for becomes angry, pushes you, grabs you, yells or becomes aggressive once, they most likely will do it again. A lot of caregivers, no, it only happened once. I guarantee you that if it happened once, it will happen again. You need to put a plan in place. What I'm saying with that uh, is that, um, remember when I told you to tell people that you trust family members or friends? Ask a few of them, is it okay if I call you, if I cannot handle a situation and I need an extra pair of hands or someone to distract them, are you willing to come over? So if they say yes, get at least three, four people on the list so not everybody can come every time you call. So you have that backup. Now, the other thing that I want to tell you is if their behavior really escalates like that with all these uh, uh, physical and behavior, this may be a wake-up call that you need to explore other alternatives as well. So if you're a healthcare worker, if this happens, it's something that you need to talk to them about. That maybe, you know, the environment that they're in now um, is, is not safe for both of you. Because at the end of the day, as a caregiver, you need to protect yourself, but you also need to protect them. And calling 911, I know, is not an easy thing to do. But that's, I've seen situations where they had to do that. Otherwise, there was no way of controlling that person. So let's go to the next slide, please. What I want to say is that we all need help and support at certain times in our lives. And what um, Evelyn didn't tell you in my bio, <laughs> which I was a caregiver for my mother for over 10 years. So, uh, you know, even as being a professional and knowing all that I knew, knew I needed to get support and help as well. And uh, it wasn't an easy thing for me to do, but it certainly helped. Now, I know that friends and family could be a great support system, but sometimes it's not enough. So there are a lot of uh, resources in the community and don't be afraid to reach out to them. You're not alone in dealing with this um, sensitive situation. So as I said, there's a lot of excellent resources. Now, 
If you are shy to speak about it, about this problem in person, you might be more comfortable with the online support group or even something like this uh, to be able to um, not even show your face and but get the information that you need. Now, counseling is extremely important. Support groups are wonderful. The Alzheimer's Association in your area has all kinds of information and courses uh, that they can provide. We have the triple A's in all areas. Evelyn will tell you a little bit more, a little bit how to get in touch with them. So what I wanna say to you is please don't, you're not alone in this. You don't have to do this on your own. Now we might stay with this slide, but the next slide, remember I told you there's lots of, of um, references that I have for you. And um, if you wanna sort of get into this a little bit more and get more information, uh, the next slide definitely has references. So if you want these slides, they will be available to you. I'm looking at the time and I'm glad that we have sufficient time. Now I know it's not easy, but let's get the conversation going. If you don't want to show your face, you can um, write, you don't have to, you could change your name. Uh, these references were good, but you know, you, you don't have to look at that. Maybe we can go back to the first uh, to the first slide of the topic that we're talking about and move from there. Okay. Okay, I'm folks. Here. This is I'm your here. <laughs> your opportunity and if you would unmute yourself or um, press star six if you're on the phone, we would love to hear from you. I think somebody tried and I'm sorry I talked over you. Did somebody wanna say something to Lucy? Wow, all this information and we have, you know, how did you handle it when you went through any kind of sexual um, behavior issue can you can you tell us can you help us are you talking to me or to them <laughs> i'm talking to them and we got a response from susan cleverton to everyone what is the percentage of people who do these inappropriate sexual behaviors you know what that's really very hard to identify because it depends when i look at research uh, it depends on the uh, the amount of people that were in this research those that or experiences, those that weren't experiences. But I do have to say that there is, there, it, it, it's a high percentage of people that have any form of dementia that could exhibit this kind of behavior now, but you have to separate it. Okay, if somebody's undressing themselves, even though it's inappropriate sexual behavior, it doesn't mean that it's sexual in nature. And as I also said, if somebody is, um, doing things that you feel are sexually inappropriate for, let's say uh, the person is swearing, okay? It might appear to be that way, but maybe that's the only way they can express themselves. But so you have to kind of look, now I don't want to say that, ev no, not everyone with dementia or, uh, exhibits this kind of behavior, but there is a high percentage of the do. Okay, we have another question from Jenny. Where can we find the recording? And Minerva has already answered. <laughs> the recording will be posted on the website within 24 hours. And, and it will include the resources. I know that uh, Jenny missed the first 15 minutes and she's gonna share the, the resources and the slides with her, with her colleagues. So thank you so much for that. Okay, folks. Evelyn, I have a question for Lucy. Yes. If you can hear me. Yes. Um, my mom has some behavior, and uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if it's sexual or not, um, but it's like hands in the pants hundreds of times, at, like all day, uh, except maybe when she's distracted. So it's like, you know, when she's watching the TV, focused on the TV, it's when she's wandering around, when she's, you know, standing in her bedroom, walking through the kitchen and it's constant. And I'm not sure if it's sexual or she's just like fiddling with her underwear or, you know, just moving her underwear around. I don't know. But all I know is when her hands are in her pants, she's then touching everything around her. And so it's like, I'm running out of Lysol wipes and I don't know, like, is, is there, is there a better way to handle? Like, I, 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 I kind of like the idea of, I don't know if stuff in the pockets would help or not, um, but 
yeah, friend, maybe I get, need to give her some kind of fidgety toys. Any suggestions? Because I'm I'm gearing towards maybe it's not sexual, but you know, it's 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 hands in the crotch, hands in the front of the pants, all day. Oh, I can, really... but not but not in public because I think oh. she's too distracted by other things. <laughs> so oh. so far, so far, it's only been at home. <laughs> Remember, distract and redirect. <laughs> Okay, but what I really sympathize and I understand how uncomfortable that might make you feel as well. You know, it's your mother. We don't want to think of our mothers putting our their hands and their private parts. I, you know, I was a, I was my mother's caregiver, and and that would really be something that I would be uncomfortable with. But I'm just questioning: when was the last time that she she went to her doctor? Could it be that something medically is going on? Could she maybe have a urinary tract infection or something medically that's uh, irritating her? You know, sometimes even have, and besides a, a urinary tract infection, it could be any other irritant that our parts are very sensitive, especially vagina parts are very sensitive. Can I say that? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, are very sensitive. It could be... You know, sometimes people are allergic to the detergent that you use and, and, and the underwear or things like that. So I would definitely want to go. I would take my mother to see the doctor and explain to the doctor what's going on. I know it might be difficult in a way because maybe your mom might need to see a gynecologist and just to make sure that every but at least you can start with a family doctor to make sure that uh, some blood tests are done and uh, it might be something like that. You know, believe it or not, that some medical conditions can also sensitize that area as well. And so do medications. So that's what I would suggest. Now, the apron might be a way, you know, that might be something that you might want to try because um, if she's fidgeting. The other thing that I also want to say is masturbating or touching yourself can be a very soothing to the person with dementia. They don't recognize and realize that they're doing something in public that, you know, we are not supposed to do in public or even around our children, but it could be a soothing part to them. So again, it all depends on how comfortable or uncomfortable you are. And the fact that she's touching and then touching everything else is an issue. So I would try the first thing is to go and see the doctor. Yeah, I think so far it's been like, nobody's really in the house seeing it. So I'm just like, <laughs> hey, whatever. And and if she's just, if it's just fidgeting, it's really the taking the hands out of the pants and then you know, like wanting to touch everything in the kitchen. It's yeah. been kind of just the, the germ part that yes. I think has really been uh, yeah. that the issue but um yeah those are some those are some great tips for me i appreciate yeah, your help i'm so glad that you're both here oh i'm glad it's interesting what you said that nobody wants to talk about it i mean i'm okay i'm okay talking i'm yes. okay talking yes. about it and, and and i notice you know i notice it but i i usually work remote so i'm kind of sometimes i'm seeing it in a monitor and i'm not always there and it's it's just, the hard part is for me the communication of trying to figure out is there something wrong like is your underwear bothering you do we need to get you a different style of underwear you know it's what i'm wondering um but when I say, you know, is your underwear bugging you? Is your underwear bunching up or something? She can't give me an answer. And she just like repeat underpants to me, you know, you know how it is kind of the repeat parrot. So I feel like I'm trying to ask the question, seeing like, does she need different clothing? Um, is that bugging her? But it's, you know, it's, you know, how, you know, how you two know, what you, everybody here knows how it is, that it's hard to get the answer. <laughs> so, it's very hard. Yeah. Start with the doctor and see where that goes. See what the and then, you know, I, thank you so much for sharing because other people are listening and maybe they wouldn't feel as comfortable as you are. And I so appreciate it that you're doing this. Thank you. So I will say there have some been some funny things too. Like we went to um we went to a cookout and somebody we had just like we had just met some new people that we knew some people there and other people were brand new. And my mom just walked right up to this guy and kissed him right on the mouth in front of his girlfriend. And I thought, I mean, it was, we just laughed it off, but, it was, but that hasn't happened. <laughs> but that was just kind of a funny one that 
you know, kind of threw everybody for a loop. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I mean, I'm glad that you were able to laugh at it, but inside mm -hmm. many caregivers feel so embarrassed, mm -hmm. ashamed for the person also. Like they don't want them to be judged. You don't want your mom to be judged because she's not the person that she was. We have a question from Dawn. <clears throat> Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes I can. Okay. Okay. Um, I just, my husband has Parkinson's. He's on carbidopa levodopa, and one of the things he has started doing in the last couple months is like bargaining for sex. Like I went to our daughter's birthday party, so now you should have sex with me. Is that normal? Is that something I should ask the doctor about? Is that the, the medication? Remember in the beginning what I said that some couples who've had really good sexual relationship and the, one of them has dementia and all of a sudden they're asking so much more of that person. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is normal for them, but not normal for you. <laughs> No, absolutely <laughs> no nobody look I want to tell you I've had uh, caregivers who have actually told me elderly women my husband is raping me every night or he oh. tried to rape me I can't take it anymore nobody should be sexually abused in any form even though we know that so it's really important that you you protect yourself as well okay, okay. mm-hmm and the first thing that I would do, if he hasn't gone to the doctor and the doctor is not aware of his behavior, you need to take him to the doctor. Okay. You're right. Maybe some medications. Remember, I said that even if the doctor prescribed, always ask, what are the side effects? Now, one of the best people you can ask is your pharmacist. They know more about medication than your doctor does. Okay. So, okay. I wish you all the best, but. Thank you. No, you don't need, you need to protect yourself. And again, try and use like, be firm. Mm -hmm. but don't, don't feel guilty that you're not giving in. Okay. Nobody needs to give in. Okay. 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 And he hasn't been aggressive about it physically, but verbally he is. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. I would be concerned about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that also. You're giving other people an opportunity to just be able to express what they're going through. We had a request from Jenny to see the first few slides again, which is the only request we have at this moment. I don't know how you feel about that, Lucy. Sure, we can go to the next one, you know. This one, I talked about what I was going to speak about. You can get all these slides once Evelyn will tell you how to do that. We can go to the next slide also. I really basically were talking about that, uh, you know, if you're not comfortable talking about sexuality, it has to do with your own, um, your, who you are. And I mean, let's be honest, uh, when we watch TV, sex is everywhere, right? But there is something about still about ageism in our society. We talk about sexuality and intimacy with young people, but there's still that funny feeling about ah, older people should not be engaged in any of that. All right. So, so this is basically what we were talking about. And I was trying to say that sexuality and intimacy, we all need it. We all need to be touched. So even if someone has dementia and they're inappropriate. Sometimes caregivers tell me, I want to give him a hug, but I'm afraid that if I give him a hug, he'll want more. You know, mm -hmm. how do you balance all that? That's the part. So that's why you need support. And that's why it's so important to have someone to talk to about it and to get the counseling. And as professionals, if any of you are, uh, it's so important to be able like, you don't have to ask, are you having sex with your partner or your husband or whoever? You can ask things like, do you still have intimate relationship? And how is that going? You could, you, you know, to, don't ignore that subject. Because I'm telling you, I had a an elderly lady that was caring for her husband. This was in my younger years of being a social worker. All she wanted was assistance with bathing, okay? So I go in there. I was in a home care department. 
I do an assessment, no problem. The house is lovely. They seem to be getting along. I told her I will refer a physiotherapist to come and assess the bathroom so that there's bars, whatever. As I'm walking out at the door, she, she was quite short. So she, and I'm short too, so you could imagine. So she sort of asked me to come down and she whispers in my ear, as I said to you, my husband is raping me, it's trying every single night. I can't take it any longer. I was shocked. I'm talking about like maybe 25, 30 years ago. It wasn't something we talked about. And I knew right then and there that I could not leave her in that house another day. She said, he's hurting me. Okay, so that's why it is so important to ask these questions. So just to let you know what happened, in case you're curious, I made sure that there was a respite bed for her husband. We talked about it. I told her that she does not, uh, she, she, she was being attacked and they did put him in a respite bed. She got a social worker to deal with that at the agency where he was placed and Eventually, she had to place him. Yes. Wow, well, what a story. Okay. Um, All right. So, oh, wow, we're almost at the top of the hour. Anyway, yeah. what I want to say to all of you, if you're having difficulty with that, uh, get the help that you need. Evelyn, maybe you could tell them about some resources that are available that people can reach out to. Right. You know, in the United States, we have something called Adult Protective Services, which is um, readily available for a referral through your local area agency on aging. Now, Adult Protective Services work closely with the police. All the reports that go in from social workers, from any from caregivers, from anyone in the community, go directly to the police. So if there's something really dangerous, the police actually go out. But often it's a team of social workers who are case managers, you know, who when they assess a situation and understand the problem, they can make appropriate referrals, either for respite or for placement or for psychotherapy or whatever a person needs. So adult protective services is a, a very important piece in, in, this, in this arena here. How to find adult protective services in your area is by going on Elder Care Locator, which is eldercare.acl.gov, or you can call 800-677-1116 and just say, what's the number of my local area agency on aging or my local adult protective services program? And they can give you either of those. During the week, there's actually a live body who puts in your your zip code, which is what you would do online and can tell you right away and can talk to you about, you know, what else there might be available. So it's a very interesting um, asset that we have funded by uh, our administration on aging. Um, also, you can call 211 because locally, most of those programs can give you all of that same information and they can tell you, you know, the hours you know, they have a big computer system in front of them, which is where the elder care locator gets their information from 211 and from the area agencies on aging. So there's a couple of um, options there. I would also say that, um, I know Lucy talked about online um, help and support groups. Um, I would like to mention telehealth. Uh, because I think that if you do talk to your doctor and you're a full-time caregiver and can't make that office visit that Lucy talked about, you know, get on a video call with the doctor or ask the doctor on your, if you have a portal to your health care, ask them for a referral to someone in the mental health field, because that is, it's an amazing asset for people who can't travel, for people who maybe are too shy to actually say to another person, my husband's raping me or my my wife is raping me, you know, so make sure you use that, um, take advantage of that asset in your healthcare arena. And Lucy, I don't know if you have any other um, ideas. If not, I'm going to talk about the rest of the schedule for the month. No, I'm, I'm fine. 
Go okay. ahead. We wore you out, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> so we have three um, really amazing presentations left this month. Uh, Dr. Pr Nestor Pradario, who is one of the few geropsychiatrists in our country. There's 4,000 for uh, 30 million seniors, by the way. <laughs> he is going to present on next Tuesday, January 16th. He's going to talk about, you know, giving you a guide uh, to living with Alzheimer's disease if you're a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's disease, and that will be in Spanish. So if you're Spanish speaking, you may want to enjoy that one. That's Tuesday um, at 10 o'clock Central Time. On uh, the following Tuesday, the 23rd, how to manage your expectations as a caregiver. Very interesting topic because a lot of times, you know, we were talking beforehand about how, you know, your expectations around the holidays really kind of picture how stressed out you are, you know, because a lot of times it's you and, you know, all the hype around holidays and how you feel about it. So he's going to talk about, you know, I think some of the hype about being a caregiver. Um and then on January 30th, which is another Tuesday, we're going to talk about caring can be rewarding, but stressful. So how to build on the positives. And dear Lucy and Elliot Montgomery Sklar will be talking about that. It'll be very interesting as they try to turn us around from feeling all of these negatives into getting into a more positive attitude about the fabulous gift that we are giving. So with that, I am just going to do a few closing comments. Um, Lucy said that I would tell you how to get the slides. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you are registered, you will automatically get the slides in a couple days. And if you're not registered, if you've got the number or the, the link from someone else, please call our customer service representative at 866-390-6491. That's 866-390-6491. And as an extra bonus, you will get the monthly calendar um, with, with the questionnaire that comes out. So it's a post-session questionnaire and the resources. And we ask that you take that questionnaire seriously and let us know how we're doing. Let us know if there's a presentation that you would like to hear. Um, we're really interested in trying to improve all the time. And I want to just take the time to thank all of our caregivers who joined us today. Um, those who participated, thank you for making our podcast even richer and better and helping other caregivers and us, Lucy and I learn from every one of these. Um, also want to thank Lucy so much for her presentation and all of her experience, you know, because all of that rolls up into helping us you know, really learn from what other people have learned from. And that's such a great bonus. Also, I want to end by thanking the WellMed Charitable Foundation for all of these presentations, for scheduling them, for doing the podcasts on them, for having the Caregiver Teleconnection treasury of podcasts on their website, and for the wonderful Minerva, who always shepherds us through these presentations. <laughs> and I really appreciate all that they do for caregivers. And it's not just on the caregiver teleconnection. They also um, have clinics. They have SOS clinics. They are the ones who sponsor a lot of the like uh, annual summit for caregivers and do a lot of stuff in the community, not just in Texas, but also in Florida. So thank you, WellMed Charitable Foundation, and thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate um, your being with us and hope to see you again soon. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much, Lucy. Great job as always. Bye, everybody. Please take care of yourself.